and thank you for listening to the History of World War II podcast, episode 195, The Beginnings of Pearl Harbor. Last time, during the Sea Battles of the Atlantic, the British had traded the HMS Hood, the last battlecruiser built for the Royal Navy, for the German mammoth Bismarck. And right there, in the middle, had been an American pilot, Tuck Smith. Churchill's intention of drawing the U.S. into the war was working. What wasn't working was FDR's attempt to get the Germans to blatantly fire on U.S. personnel, thus angering the American citizenry. But Hitler was too crafty for that, ordering his Kriegsmarine to pull back so that incidents are eliminated as far as possible. Der Fuhrer was attempting to calm the passions of his warriors. While in Asia, the situation was, conversely, heating up. Japan did not believe it should hide its desire to control Asia. The Germans and the Italians weren't hiding anything. Why should they? As the dominant race in the area, to their way of thinking, it only made sense. But what really bothered the Japanese leaders was the vast Asian territory held by Western powers. The Philippines, French Indochina, Dutch Indonesia... British Malaysia, and Hong Kong, not to mention the many islands. Just after the U.S. Pacific Fleet settled in at Pearl Harbor in May of 1940, Japan's foreign ministry announced its Greater East Asia Co-Prosperity Sphere. It was only right that Asia should be ruled by an Asian power, and Japan had decided that was to be them. Asia for Asiatics was the popular phrase. And there were some non-Japanese Asians okay with this. It was about time that their part of the world was looked after and looked over by one of their own. And if the Western powers weren't willing to leave on their own, perhaps they would get the message with a sharp, short Japanese military victory. Again, this was not anything that was being hidden from the world. After Paris fell in June of 1940, Japan seized this opportunity to take northern French Indochina, modern Vietnam, and Laos, mostly. FDR responded by increasing support to China, his only real active option, and embargoed any scrap metal going to Japan. But Tokyo answered this increase in diplomatic speak by signing the Tripartite Pact in September with Germany and Italy. And now that Japan had allies, some within the Japanese military, that was basically running the show, wanted to move even more boldly throughout Asia. As such, a frenzied momentum built up to end the issue and take on the Americans, the last remaining obstacle to dominating Asia. For those opposed to this, they were quickly silenced. Some were killed or figured out it was best to remain quiet. Those that wanted to pit themselves against America claimed that this coming war was the way of the gods, which made it even harder to argue against. Still, there was one who, unafraid, said that not only should Japan not join with Germany and Italy, but that war with the United States was to be avoided at all cost. This was Admiral Isoruku Yamamoto, who not only spoke English fluently, but had served two terms in the 1920s as naval attaché in Washington. In short, he understood the Navy of the United States better than any other Japanese naval officer. But again, even he was defying powerful forces. The self-important but quite efficient League of Diet members supporting the prosecution of the Holy War, who removed even through murder, those that stood in their way, told Yamamoto he had to resign or die. But then, in stepped his protege, current naval minister Admiral Yonai. Yonai had told Yamamoto to go to sea, to lead the combined fleet, Japan's main fighting force. Ironically, Yamamoto was safer out there. And yet Admiral Yamamoto, the son of a samurai, knew his duty was to the Emperor Hirohito and to his country. If the United States was to be engaged, it was Yamamoto's responsibility to design the surprise attack, for that's what it had to be. 
it had served Japan well in the Russo-Japanese War at the opening of the 20th century, and it would buy Japan the time it needed to secure Asia. Normally, Japan liked to draw an enemy in and strike its naval power with its own close to Japan's home ports for support. But that is not how the Americans and the British would be brought low. This time, Japan had to project its own power far from home at Pearl Harbor, where the U.S. Pacific Fleet was now based. And this meant aircraft. Yamamoto was a specialist in naval aviation, and he drew upon his knowledge to design the plan that would reduce America's strength in the Pacific with one mighty blow. As the Admiral described in his nine-page note, entitled, Opinions on War Preparations, with the United States Pacific Navy humbled, Japan would have sufficient time to grab other Asian territory and solidify their hold on them. But also, if the attack at Pearl Harbor was harsh enough, Yamamoto, who had studied in the States for two years and believed he knew the Americans and their weaknesses, the United States would lose its heart to fight, certainly enough as to not be able to rebuild an entirely new navy and send it out east, to only then engage in an island-by-island campaign. No, the Americans were not disciplined enough. He ended his notes with, The operation is a gamble, but a surprise attack will be the most effective way of holding the U.S. fleet in check, because this is what they will least expect. Yamamoto was right and wrong. His plan also called for simultaneous attacks on the Philippines, Singapore, and other Western-held territory. He wrote, We should do our very best at the outset of the war with the United States, and we should have a first determination of deciding the fate of the war on its first day. Ironically, he was counting on Germany and Italy tying down Allied forces in Europe and the Atlantic while the Japanese would soon dominate Southeast Asia. As we have seen, Hitler was hoping to take down Russia, which would force Britain to sue for peace, which would leave the Americans, now hopeless in Europe, to focus on Asia. The Axis partners did not share their future plans with each other. In time, Yamamoto's plans would be accepted and used against the United States. But more on this later. For now, the organization for the coming war with the U.S. was begun. But Yamamoto had put one more item in his paper for war. He wanted to lead the air attack against Pearl Harbor. He was a naval aviation expert after all. But as this was a gamble, he wanted to die in service to his country and emperor if the attack was not successful. As the gears of war slowly turned in Tokyo, rumors got out. Soon, some of them reached the U.S. ambassador there, Joseph Grew. He was informed by several other foreigners and even one Japanese official that if war came between the two countries, that the Japanese had a plan, already drawn up, to send an overwhelming force to Pearl Harbor. Grew did not believe a word of this. Tokyo was going to send a large force 4,000 miles to Pearl Harbor and strike without the United States having a clue of what was going on? Ridiculous. Still, prudence was always the best course. Gru sent word of this rumor to Secretary of State Cordell Hull. He sent it to the Secretary of War, Henry Stimson. Stimson passed it on to George Marshall, Army Chief of Staff. Yet Marshall, when looking at the map, for some inexplicable reason, only thought in terms of a Japanese attack that had a view to occupation. As such, as he told his army commander there, if no serious harm is done to us during the first six hours of known hostilities, thereafter the existing defenses would discourage an enemy against the hazard of an attack. This cumbersome wording basically meant Pearl Harbor had too many armed forces not to be able to repel a Japanese occupation attempt. And as for a harassing air raid, again, Pearl had hundreds of fighters 
for such a contingency. So Marshall wrote back to Stimson, Oahu is the strongest fortress in the world, and that plans were moving forward to bolster the island's air strength with additional new and technologically advanced fighters, patrol planes, and B-17 bombers. Pearl Harbor was, for all intents and purposes, impregnable. But, of course, nothing is impossible. Just as Yamamoto's idea that one solid slap would crush American pride and bring her to the negotiating table. But in order for the gamble to pay off, Yamamoto had to know everything about the American forces at Pearl Harbor. So Takeo Yoshikawa left Japan in April of 1941. Yoshikawa had spent his youth developing his mind and body in order to serve the emperor when he grew up. His was the way of Bushido, the unquestioning and absolute loyalty of the samurai. Yet in 1936, he had to retire from the Imperial Navy due to a stomach ailment. However, the Navy brought him back when they found out he had been learning English. Ordered to learn everything he could about the U.S. Navy, Yoshikawa spent three years at the American desk of the Navy General Staff. When he was bound for Pearl, his orders were to report on the daily readiness of the American fleet and bases. Of obvious import were the number of ships at Pearl each day and the number of aircraft, but also their dispersal patterns. He spent time deciphering the American air defense's readiness and security measures. As there were just over 80,000 Japanese people in Oahu alone, he was not noticed. But... It goes further than that. U.S. Army intelligence, which knew Japanese spies were about, were on orders from the War Department not to harass possible spies. After all, who wanted to go down in the history books as the man who started an international incident with Japan that led to war? However, the FBI Honolulu Bureau Chief Robert Shivers was not so hemmed in. In fact, he was under orders to conduct very thorough, complete investigations of all Japanese consular agents. Problem was, no one was looking into the daily activities of Tadashi Morimura, Yoshikawa's cover name, the newly arrived Vice Consul General of the Japanese Consulate in Honolulu. Tadashi rarely showed up to work, drank a lot, talked back to his superiors, and had women spend the night in his room. No, this was not someone of the samurai class Tokyo would send to spy on the Americans. <laughs> 